Hello everyone, I'm Sarah Puccini. I'm the Assistant Director of the Lackawanna Historical Society and thank you for joining us on this beautiful day uh, for another segment of our Lackawanna Pastimes video series. Um, in April we've been looking at the history of local communities in Lackawanna County and today we will continue with the history of Covington Township, um, the eastern part of the, of the county. Um, we're joined today by Ted Baird um, who is uniquely qualified to outline the history of Covington. Ted is a native of the township and a descendant of the first settlers. He was a part of the recent Bicentennial Committee to celebrate Covington Township's 200th anniversary. Ted is an LHS member and a volunteer and a member of the Society for Pennsylvania Archaeology. You may recognize Ted from some of our Children's Day programs um, when he always brings an archaeology display uh, to show early Indian history of Lackawanna County. Uh, Ted, I'll turn the program over to you now. Okay, okay. And, and I'm going to share my screen with you. Um, Great. Uh, You'll have to excuse me. I have have cards. If you see me looking at the cards, I'm absolutely terrible with dates, uh, so I, I have cards to remind myself of, of the dates. Uh, now, Covington Township, uh, as I said, the, the uh, bicentennial was the year before last. It was uh, uh, 2018 was our bicentennial. I, I hardly believed it was old enough to be, to be that. Uh, one of the first things that, that we're, you're usually asked in history is, is, you know, who were the Native Americans that lived in the area? And the, the common uh, knowledge is the Lene Lenape. But I have to say, I have never found anybody that have, has ever found an artifact, Native American artifact within the boundaries of Covington Township. There's, there's some from Springbrook, uh, uh, Madison uh, Township, uh, we know of some down in Lehigh, matter of fact, a rather large site down in, Le in Lehigh, uh, just outside the boundaries of the current Covington Township. But I, I don't know of any within Covington Township itself as it stands today. Uh, the only indication of Indians we have is this house here, which belonged to the Indians, but that was their last name. It was a... a, a English couple, and, and, and that was, just happened to be their last name. Uh, the other indication was this picture that somebody gave me. It says, Indians in the Daleville Cemetery in 1919. The lady that, uh, that let me copy the picture said that her father had told her that these Native Americans were on their way to a powwow, and they, they passed through Daleville on the way. Uh, I don't think that's true. I think her father was pulling her leg. I think it's probably the fraternal order of Redmen. And this is in the, it looks more like the terrain for the, um, the Moscow Cemetery and possibly the bit that's within Covington Township. Um, the, as I said, there's, there's no archeological evidence within the township that I know. I'd love if somebody were able to find it in, and let me know about it. Uh, 1787 is when Henry Drinker, the elder, and I use the, the term the elder rather than senior because I've seen in one place that he was an uncle and another place that he was a father of the Henry Drinker that, was, that settled here. Um, he bought 25,000 acres, including wh what is now Covington Township in 1787. And 1787 is a, a, uh, uh, interesting year in his, in a, that was when it was finally settled between Connecticut and Pennsylvania as to own, who owned the land. Up until that time, the Connecticut people were still claiming that they owned down to just about where Interstate 80 is. And uh, Henry Drinker was a good enough businessman to know that you didn't buy property that was disputed. So he bought these, this large amount of, of acreage in 1787 possibly 10 cents on the dollar from uh, veterans because a lot of veterans received land as, as part of their payment for their service. And that was a fairly common thing for, for businessmen to do at the time. Uh, it's interesting to note that the elder drinker also served as a commissioner to improve Sullivan's Road, uh, which comes up through the Poconos. It's uh, currently uh, Route 115. And he his commission that he was on rerouted the, the, the road through Stoddardsville rather than the original path that came through what is now Thornhurst. 
um, which is within the, the lands that was part of Covington Township at, at one time. Um, he moved it over there toward to the falls of the, the, the Lehigh in order to uh, make it an easier uh, way to run a mill, to get uh, produce down to maybe use the Lehigh River to get down to uh, the markets. Uh, it was also an easier route for people to take when they were on their way to Wilkes-Barre. Um, the drinkers always seemed to be involved in some sort of transportation scheme. In 1792, John DeLong was hired to cut a road from a point near Mile 21 on the old North-South Road, that's the one that goes through Hamlin from Mount Pocono, uh, to near, near Sterling to Bell Meadow Brook, which is near where the Keystone residence is, if anybody knows where that is. It's currently in Clifton Township. Uh, that road, we'll, we'll be able to see where that is in just a moment, because this is the map of when the Covington Township was created. I'm gonna to try to blow it up here so you could see it a little bit better. Uh, I, I particularly like that it's labeled Shades of Death uh, through the area that I now live. Uh, and that was uh, pretty well what, what the Pennsylvanians called the um, Pocono Plateau. It was not easy land to get through. Uh, one of the reasons it wasn't settled heavily before this time was the difficulty in getting around. Now the Henry, the uh, old drinker road comes in through here. Uh, can you all see my cursor? Okay, it, it comes in through here, it follows this route, it goes past Lake Henry, uh, known nowadays as Eagle Lake. Uh, my grandfather called it Leech Pond, but uh, to sell uh, weekend lots to tourists, uh, Leech Pond doesn't really uh, cut it. And Eagle Lake is more, more impressive than Lake Henry. Uh, but it came down and, and to about this area here, near, near where um, uh, Goolsboro, getting close to where Goolsboro would be. Um, Another interesting thing on this map is the mountain range here, instead of the Musick Mountains, it's called the, the Lackawanic Mountains. And this is, is probably my favorite thing on this map. It shows Roaring Brook or Gully Creek. Uh, and if you've ever walked along Roaring Brook in Covington Township, you can see where it got that name. The, the, uh, it has very, very steep walls in quite a few places, uh, but I particularly like Gully Creek. Now the original um, Covington Township covered uh, a good bit more land than current Covington Township, Madison, uh, parts of Springbrook, Clifton were all taken from Covington Township. So, but I'm, I'm going to try to concentrate just on the area which is within the current borders. Um, in 1814, Henry W., and I'll just call him Henry Drinker from now on for, for ease, and Richard Drinker had inherited the land and they had it in re, uh, resurveyed by Mr. Corey of Bethany, PA. If you're into, uh, know anything about Wayne County history, he was a, he was a very uh, prolific surveyor from that area. And it was made into lots averaging about 100 acres to be sold at $5 an acre at, on five years credit. And the first two years were interest free. So it was bargain prices. But uh, the drinkers realized that the, the value was in opening up the, the land more so than, than getting uh, a price for a piece of property. They were able to be paid in labor, people working on the road. Uh, the drinker turnpike coming through, stock, produce, lumber, shingles, things like that. Now, the, the settlers came in uh, not through the old drinker road so much, although some, some did, but from the west from Stoddardsville. And so Stoddardsville stands pretty big in, in Covington history, even though it hardly exists anymore. Uh, in 1815, Henry and Richard entered the area from Stoddardsville upstream on a boat pulled by a large white horse. 
and he, they didn't have an easy time. They had to cut out a lot of tangles, things like that, that were in the way uh, to open up the Lehigh River. If anybody's been along a creek in the woods, you know that it doesn't take long for them to get choked with, with all sorts of brush. They encamped and later built a log home on Mill Creek along the Lehigh, and that's no longer in Covington Township, but that's where they, they settled. In 1818, Covington Township was established and it was cut out of Wilkes-Barre Township. Uh, and it was named for Brig Brigadier General Leonard Covington, who was killed in the War of 1812 in Williamsburg, Canada. And it's believed that Henry may have served under um, Covington. Even though he was a Quaker, he was a fighting Quaker. Um, he then, then after he, they'd gotten the, the land survey, they decided to sell it. He must have done a good bit of marketing in Yorkshire, England, because that's where the, the, the majority of the first settlers of Daleville came from. And um, in 1819, Edward Wardell and David Dale were the first settlers, and they built a log cabin, which both families lived in for the first winter, and they planted wheat which was harvested the next year and that is considered what they're saying was the first crop in the area now edward wardell he was he was an ancestor of mine i but i can't brag too much about being a descendant of his because if you scratch half of the population in covington township they're going to be related to, to edward wardell uh he had he brought two sons with him and they did not uh, hold back on having children. Um, Edward Wardell Sr. and Anne Major Wardell, Major was her maiden name, had nine children altogether, uh, four of which lived to adulthood. Most of them died as infants. Uh, one son died at age nine, but four lived to adulthood. Uh, Mary and Thomas were, were the two, two that stayed in England, and they didn't emigrate. Uh, Thomas had a girlfriend and a job, and Mary was married. But they did bring um, Edward and Henry drink, or Henry Wardell with them. Anne's brother, Thomas Major, came to Northeast Pennsylvania with 11 children uh, in 1821, and they settled in Lehman. If, it, if you're familiar with the history of Lehman, the, the Majors play a, a big part in that. Elizabeth married her first cousin, Edward Wardell Jr. So the Thomas Major's daughter from Lehman came to Covington Township and married her cousin, uh, Edward Wardell Jr. Edward Wardell in England worked as a farm laborer, a shepherd, a hind, which is watching after the animals, a grocer, and a man of all work. He was able to rent a farm and was successful and he got it up running and made it profitable. And then the owner sold it out from under him. Then he um, was able to get a, to sublet a farm from a relative and he got that up and running and profitable. And the relative decided to take up farming again. Uh, didn't like being retired. That's when he and Anne decided to emigrate to America. Anne had inherited some money and um, which is probably why her brother came here also. And they just wanted to make sure that their two sons had a, a land of their own and didn't have to rely on, on uh, renting land from other people and having such uncertainty in their, in their lives. Uh, Edward bought 250 acres. I don't know how much Dale, David Dale bought. Uh, I have more information on Edward because a, a cousin of, or a descendant of Thomas that stayed in England kept a journal and he provided me with copies of the journal and it, and it gave this information. That's why I know that. Uh, the Dale family, it was David Dale and Margaret Tanfield Dale. Now the Tanfields come into Covington later, but, but not through Margaret. Uh, her children were John, Elizabeth, David, Mary, William, Frank, James, Mark, and um, a Mary and uh, David and Sarah were other children. That they had more than one child with the same name because they uh, probably died in infancy. 
1820, the Covington census shows another child in their household, so it's prob possible they had a, another child after they arrived here. Um, David Dale's naturalization says that he landed in America in New York, and Edward Wardell landed in Philadelphia. But the stories that have been told for, for a long time in this area is that they came to Covington together. So either they met on the way and traveled from there, they had planned a meeting place on the way, or uh, David Dale then sailed down to Philadelphia and, and met up with the Wardells and came up here. Um, interesting um, in this, I, I have a, a copy of the manifest, Ship's Manifest that the Wardell family came in. They have his name spelled Edward Wardale. Uh, they came in steerage. Uh, there are no Dales on this boat, but there is a Ralph Hodson, H-O-D-G-S-O-N in family, that came in a cabin. And that is in, significant only in that a person with that same last name came and settled in Covington Township. It's, it's probable that, that there was some sort of a connection there. Um, in uh, said about uh, the Tanfields, which is a very large family here in Covington Township. He was a house painter. painter. He came in 1842, and he was like 27 years younger than David Dale's wife. So it's probable she was an aunt or a, or a cousin or something like that. And he came to live where the family had, had been, where family had settled, where he knew people. The first marriage in Covington Township was John Dale to Ellen Yates of Philadelphia. Whether he met her down there or she came up here, who knows. Uh, the second marriage was Edward Wardell to the Elizabeth Major that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the first death was a Henry Raish, R-A-I-S-H. He was eight years old and his mother was the first weaver. They lived just about where Langan Road meets uh, 435 now, if you're familiar with it. Um, in 1824, the first school was taught by John Fish, and it was taught in his own home. They didn't have a schoolhouse yet. And in 1826, the first frame house was built by Edward Wardell. Now I have two pictures of Wardell's houses. The, the first one, it was labeled on the back of the picture, uh, Edward Wardell house, but um, this doesn't have the same configuration of windows as the later picture that I think has more credence to it. Uh, but this is, is one of the Dale or the Wardell descendants standing in front of one of the Wardell houses. Seeing that he came over with uh, teenage sons, it wasn't long before they were, they were getting married and, and building homes of their own and, and moving out. Uh, but the actual first house, this is from a picture that was in the, the Scranton newspapers in the 1840, 1940s showing the, the Daleville's oldest house. And at that time, it was the home of the great, great, uh, the great granddaughter. Uh, her name was, um, last name was Wambacher. Uh, this is the, the house. Oop, wrong, wrong thing. There we go. This is the house. And it stood just about where the entrance to Bill's uh, uh, plaza is now. Uh, another thing that they showed was a apple tree that was planted in uh, 1819, which seems like a pretty spindly apple tree for being that age, but I don't know what variety of apple it was. Maybe it was a, a shoot that came up from a stump or something like that. But uh, this house no longer is, exists. It was uh, the house was torn down in the, in the 40s and um, the late 40s and the Wambachers built a new house. Uh, David Dale built the first hotel as well as a tavern. Uh, let's see, here we go. The, this is the, I gotta make this smaller again. This is the uh, store that was built by David Dale. The, a uh, hotel that he that he uh, 
opened up was, was next door to that on the right hand side. The Dale House was on the left hand side of, of this building. Um, and Edward Wardell opened a, a, a tavern very, very shortly after David Dale did. They, they seemed to uh, open stores and taverns right one right after the other, and there seemed to have been plenty of business for both of them. Um, the roadway through Covington Township was the, the Drinker Turnpike, and that was built by some of the people that settled here. They, as I said, they paid for their uh, land in labor, uh, as well as other things. But the, the road itself was built, I, I was told, by taking a log and driving spikes into it and having that pulled by oxen over a mile worth of the potential road. Then men would go behind, pick the rocks up, move them to the side, and have the oxen go over it again. And they'd do that over and over again until it was smooth enough for wagons to operate on. Um, this, this is Cobbley's store. It shows it's Cobbley's store. That was the uh, 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 person that took, over, took it over later. This picture, I just want to point out the, the gentleman here. He, that is Dr. Frischkorn. He was the first doctor in Covington Township. And his house is the, the caretaker's house in front of the Moffat Estate, the little stucco house at the front of the, the Moffat Estate. Um, Lackawanna Environmental Center was in there for a while. This is probably his wagon that he made rounds in. Uh, I have several pictures of this store and it's, this is another one from the same time. This shows Dale's house. Uh, this shows the, um, where the, the hotel and the, the, the bar would have been. And then later in the 50s, it was still standing, pretty much the same configuration. And it was Jones's, Jones's store at the time. To this day, this building is still here and, and pretty well looks the same. Uh, probably one of the older buildings in the whole, the whole township. Um, as I said, the first, first merchant was David Dale. And then uh, 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 Levi Lilybridge opened one uh, in the front of Edward Wardell's home. And so now, just to give you an idea, the, the Dale house was uh, in, the, in Daleville, just across from the cemetery, right next to the Methodist church. And the uh, Wardell house would have been about a half mile south of there along the road, right by where the entrance to Bill's uh, shop right is. One early settler was Matthew Hodson. And you, I can show you, this is a, a, from the Drinker's Beach articles that were in the Villager newspaper. And Matthew Hodson's house was here. And I, I mentioned him again because he was, uh, has the same last name as one of the people that was on the ship with the, the Wardells. Um, here's Lake Henry. Arthur Hughes Boulevard is this road here. And this would be the road that goes over to where, what they, they call the dry dam now. Uh, it's been drained. <laughs> uh, a, a failed effort by the, the, the Scranton Water Company to, to build a, another uh, water dam up in this area. Um, but he carried the lumber for the floors of his house six miles from the Lehigh River to his house. So um, transportation was not uh, very best. Most people didn't own a team of horses. Most people, you know, didn't uh, have the money to hire somebody to carry things there. So a lot of the stuff was carried on their backs. Many of the settlers in the early days would walk the old drinker road. Don't pay attention to how the, it flows in this map. The old drinker road would have been along here, along the, the south side of Lake Henry, and then up to here. Uh, this road down to Lehigh is, um, is, was a, at a later date. Um, but the early settlers would carry their maple sugar that they made on their backs 10 miles to Nobletown in Wayne County to the, to the east in exchange for necessities and things that they couldn't uh, manufacture themselves. Um, 
one interesting thing in the 1820 census, 69 uh, residents of Covington Township were engaged in agriculture. And as I said, it, it, Covington uh, encompassed a much larger area at the time. There was one merchant shown, which is, predates uh, David Dale's uh, being a, a opening a store. So I'm, I'm wondering who that could have been. It was probably David Dale who was selling out of his house. Two manufacturers, which probably were uh, the people over here in Turnersville, uh, that were wood turners and a road cruise cruise and they the road crews were likely the source of the 12 tree colored listed uh, because by the year 1830 they were gone and I did find a name for one of the the, the listed free colored in the in the census and I found him in 1830 up, I believe it was in Susquehanna County, and according to that town's history, he was, you know, a well-known citizen. He played the, the the fiddle, and he was very popular at dances and things like that. So, uh, it, it's very probable that uh, uh, three coloreds from the area moved in and worked on the drinker turnpike. Uh, it certainly would have been a good-paying job and, and uh, good opportunity. Uh, by 1830, the population of Covington Township had quadrupled. And the, uh, another thing, in 1870, there's, this is an, because it, it's, it's such a rare occurrence in Covington Township at the time. In 1870, there was a young African-American male that showed up in the household of Thomas Wardell and the Henry Wardell household in 1880. Uh, and his name was something like Scott Grafton or Braxton or something like that. And uh, the handwriting was terrible. And he, he was born in Virginia. Uh, the, the Henry Thomas Wardell had been in the stationed in the Civil War in Virginia. And he probably, and this young man was like in his young teens. So he wasn't like an adult that moved into the area. He probably came up here with one of the Wardells and, uh, lived in their household. Um, I think that one deserves a little bit more research. I tried finding him, him in later census, but I couldn't. There were other villages in Covington uh, Township other than Daleville. Um, incidentally, Daleville was originally called Yorktown because so many of the people were from Yorkshire, England. Uh, one of the towns and probably the most profitable tax-wise was Frytown. Uh, they had a school, they had a brickworks, they had a Methodist church. Uh, it was, uh, they had turning mills. And this town is now a, a, a ghost town. Uh, I can show you the last person who lived in what was actually Frytown here. Uh, she was jokingly called locally uh, the mayor of Frytown because she was the only one left. Uh, everybody was bought out by the Scranton Water Company. And uh, there's a little bit more on the Scranton Water Company and, and Frytown a little bit later. I have never been able to find much of anything uh, other than this Rose Shrek that lived in Frytown. Uh, that I, I would love to find a picture of a a house or something that was there, people that were living there. But I, I haven't found anybody yet that had them. However, if you want to see a house from Frytown, you travel down some of the streets in Moscow, and because a good bit of them were moved. Uh, Dr. Sullivan now lives in uh, one of the houses on Maple Street that was moved from Frytown. There is a um, house and barn on uh, Bloomington, uh, road that was moved from Frytown. As a matter of fact, it was some of the Fry's themselves that moved that house. So uh, quite a few of the structures were moved to other areas from Frytown when they were bought out in, in about 1909. Um, another village would be Beck's Mills. And I'm just going to go back here one more step here to this map to give you an idea where Beck's Mills is. Um, Beck's Mill would have been where the Fox and Hound Road meets Center Street. Uh, it's Hollister and Beck 
and company, and they had a, a sawmill down in that area. And there was a small community built up, uh, mostly employees that just lived locally, and, and it was called uh, uh, Beck's Mills. Uh, another one was down here by the Matthew Hodgson House, and it was started by an S.G. Holgate, and that was Holgate's Mills. If you went and asked anybody where Holgate's Mills was today, most people would not be able to tell you because they wouldn't, been able, wouldn't be able to tell it from uh, Daleville itself. It is so close. Uh, it, that is, as I say, by Arthur Hughes Boulevard. And uh, that turning mill itself moved from Turnersville, which is another town in uh, uh, Covington. That moved from Turnersville down to here. When the wood ran out, they moved. Um, this, I, I pointed out uh, Turnersville. This is probably the most famous person to come from uh, Turnersville, the most famous person nobody's ever heard of. Uh, he was the uh, son of the Methodist minister in Turnersville, and he ended up being uh, named American member of the Provisional Claims Committee of Nicaragua by President Hoover. And uh, he had been a, a soldier during the Spanish-American War and ended up being in the diplomatic corps in there. The, we have a nice picture of one of the houses in Turnersville. And this is Mr. Stanley's house. It would have been Reverend, Reverend Stanley's, then his, his son. This is taken from a Christmas card sent by uh, the granddaughter of Reverend, Reverend Stanley. And there's a picture of her and her uh, friend sitting in front of the fireplace on the interior of that. Uh, this Mrs. Miss Stanley was a phys ed teacher in the Scranton School District, and she wrote a book called More Truth Than Poultry. Uh, I've never seen a copy of that, and everybody I know that's interested in local history that, that knows about the book wants to get it, but nobody knows who has one. <laughs> um, Another village is that I is not on the map that I showed before is is um, uh, Staplesville, and Staplesville lies on uh, between 502 and the Dorntown Road. Uh, it's along what is called Old Schoolhouse Road, and it was halfway between 502 and Dorntown Road. And we I'll talk a little bit about uh, Staple uh, Staplesville in in a minute. Uh, let's see, did we get everybody? Turnersville, yes. Turnersville uh, was founded in 1826, so very, very shortly after the, the uh, Daleville started up. Staplesville is only 1866. Uh, Holgate's Mills was 1841. Frytown, 1830, so quite early. And Beck's Mills was 1821. It was originally uh, Espy uh, Holmes's sawmill that was built there, which was the first sawmill in Covington Township. Um, and that's, um, I've, I've gone looking for where the mill pond would be because on the map it shows a mill pond. I have not been able to figure out where a mill pond would have been, but I, I will be able to show you in, in a little bit um, where, where that was located. Uh, this, this is a, a, a a picture from it uh, of the map from an atlas which shows Covington Township as it appeared then. And this is about where Staplesville is. This, this would be 502. This would be the Dorntown Road, which is the road that comes from next to the, the Daleville Methodist Church and over to almost the western end of, of Covington Township as it appears today. Um, I, I want to show on this map, this is Hollister and Beck's mill down in here. There's also a Hodson down in here too. They, they were all over the place too. And this is a little railroad track, a spur railroad that runs into Daleville. And that was a gravity railroad from the, the later steam turning mill of, of the Dales down to Hollister and, and Beck area to be loaded onto the railroad tracks. Then they would pull the, the cart 
back up to this area with, with a, uh, mules. And that pretty well, the track pretty well goes through the area that's now uh, covered by um, the North, North Pocono High School. In, ooh, let's see, in 1819, uh, Amza Hollister Jr. married Eliza Goodrich. If you're familiar with uh, uh, Wayne County, there's a Hollisterville. This is the son that didn't settle in Hollisterville. In 1830, he moved to Covington Township, and uh, it's been reported to me, it was told to me, but I've never found any proof of it, and I'd like to, like to be able to, uh, that he was set up in business by Henry Drinker as a tavern keeper to serve as a stagecoach stop on the turnpike. Um, he also served as a justice of the peace, but he died in 1835 in Taylorsville, Virginia. If you ever travel down there and you go past, um, uh, uh, well, what's that big amusement park down there near Richmond? If you go down that way and you, you pass by there, just off to your right is, is where Taylorsville. He was down there visiting his brother, uh, who was another Hollister that didn't settle in Hollisterville. Uh, but he died in 1835 and his widow and children were still in Covington. It was just a visit. I suspect he was down there looking for a better job. Uh, his widow married a widower, Owen Simpson, who I'll talk a little bit about later, and they merged their family and Henry Drinker permitted his son to take over the contract when he reached the age of majority and it, was, it eventually was paid off in 1872 which is a nice long time for him to allow things like that to go on. Uh, his son was Benjamin Franklin Hollister and he married Ann Wardell, who was the daughter of Edward Jr. and Elizabeth Major. Uh, and I have a picture of the tavern. And this is, I'll pull this in a little bit closer. It's unfortunately, they, it wasn't, high death pictures back in those days. This is B.F. Hollister. And this, I imagine, I believe is his wife, uh, daughter of Edward Wardell Jr. This is the son, Amsda Jr. And this is Charles Major Hollister in front of the house. I particularly like the um, oxen in front of the house. Uh, this well, still stand, it it's, doesn't stand in this configuration, but there's a metal uh, door on top of this well now, and it, it exists to this day. Uh, incidentally, I was born just about here. <laughs> I was born in the, in the driveway in the front seat of a 39 Dodge, and because uh, this was a house my mother was raised in. Um, and this is pretty well what it looks like today. These Trees have been cut down because they were getting old and you can see some of the dead branches there, but they were removed. But you could also see that little strip right there. That's the metal cover on that well that was shown in the previous picture. Um, the, let's see, about a half mile down the road maybe even not half a mile down the road, was another stopping place, but it was the stopping place for drovers. And, and that is uh, what this is a picture of. This picture came from that house. Uh, I believe this is M Mr. Lamoureau here, who uh, was the one that took care of the drovers. The story is that there was a building behind this, what looks like a lilac bush, uh, the, between the house and the road that was loaded with windows. It was probably just like a, a uh, made as a dance hall and then was referred to locally rather grandly as the Crystal Palace. But actually, I, I imagine it was a, 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 a just a, a, a large ballroom with, with, with a lot of windows. I particularly like this little boy's Buster Brown hat there. Um, this is how the same house looked in, in 1942. Uh, the picture in the, the previous picture was taken around the, this side of the house, the right-hand side of the house. Um, there was, uh, as I said, Matthew, the, the 
I showed on the map where Matthew Hodgson had, had lived. He arrived in Philadelphia in 1819 on a ship the, the, called the Virgin with John Dale, who was probably the eldest son of David Dale. Now, he, they arrived in, in Philadelphia. Uh, it was not uncommon in those days for um, people traveling to split the families up so that if somebody died on the ocean on the way over or died from sickness, they didn't lose everybody in the family and, and somebody was able to take care of the possessions that they had over here. Uh, he, he, they traveled together. And as I said before, in the Edward Wardell uh, uh, ship manifest, um, it showed that it they were traveling with the Hodgson's. So they were probably split, split up also. So it, it's very probable that the Wardells, the Dales and the Hodgson's were all uh, familiar with one another in the old country. Uh, there was another person, the early person that lived in um, Covington. He was born in 1792, named George Frazee. And in the Covington Cemetery, you'll find his tombstone. And it, it was significant in that he was a, a veteran of the War of 1812. On his tombstone, it mentions Cap and Captain Coons. And a lot of people think that they were somehow, you know, buried together. But in truth, he was a, a he served in Captain Coons unit, the 16th US Infantry in the War of 1812. And they were in the Battle of Cook Cook's Mills in Upper Canada. And significantly, one of his daughters married uh, Dr. Frischkorn. And we're going to get into it, show you something about Dr. Frischkorn. They, they were an interesting group um, themselves. Uh, let's see, let's get to this. Oh, this is the Matthew Hodgson's house. At least that's what the lady that gave me this picture said, and I have no reason to doubt that picture. Uh, like many of the places along uh, route, at that time it was 611, now it's 435, many of the people uh, took in guests, many of the people uh, served tourists, and uh, the people that lived in the Hodgson's house were no different. They had this little roadside stand. Uh, there's two different views of, of the roadside stand. They sell sandwiches and, and sodas to the to the people from New York and New Jersey coming through. Now, getting back to Dr. Frischkorn, uh, the son-in-law of, of this Frazy, this is the Frischkorn house. Uh, this picture was taken by the railroad when they were uh, straightening the curves on, on the Delaware Lackawanna Railroad. The Drinker Turnpike itself runs along here, along this ridge, and this is the the caretaker's house at the Moffat estate, which was originally Dr. Frischkorn's house. Uh, down here is where St. Catherine's Cemetery would be. A lot of people are familiar with where that is. Dr. Frischkorn had another, we had very few famous people lived in Covington Township. And so we, we were, we're glad to glom on to any semi-famous people. And, and Dr. Frischkorn's son was, uh, Build himself as the great Carland. He was a magician. He was also a doctor. He was a doctor of homeopathic medicine who eventually settled in the Norfolk, Virginia area. But that, that's one of his business cards of doctor, our first doctor's uh, son. And this is a poster from uh, Carlin's Three Ring Magic Circus, who, by the way, it, three, the Three Ring Magic Circus did play in, in Scranton, I believe, at one time. Uh, uh, he, he was well known in magic circles, but not a household name today. This is a picture of where Hollister Beck Mills was. Now, it's called Hollister Beck Mills because um, A.G. Hollister, who was one of the Hollisters that settled in Hollisterville, uh, her, his daughter married Beck, and, and they owned a lot of land in this area, and they op opened the sawmill or, or renamed the sawmill. Uh, it was originally um, owned by, um, let's see, get their names right. I'll get to their names later. Uh, but as I, I say, this is 
the Hollister's Crossing uh, looking from Center Street. Uh, this was a whistle stop on the railroad and the Hollister or, and Beck House was down here along the railroad, which is about uh, maybe a quarter of a mile from Hollister's Crossing. Uh, and the foundation of it, it still sits there. The foundation of the barn, which is here, still sits there. Uh, young people like to go there and have parties. I found campfires and all sorts of stuff there. And Roaring Brook runs through the valley here. Uh, another picture taken from another direction. This is the Fox and Hound Road that comes down. That, just to give you an idea where it was. And as I say, Roaring Brook runs down through here. There's the barn in the distance. Moscow is in is about a mile down, mile mile and a half down the road this way. Uh, another early settler was a John Miller, and he's he comes in to uh, play later on. He came from Salem Corners in 1827. He lived near the Raish Cabin, which, as I said, was on Langan Road. He was a cobbler. He helped build the work on the turnpike. He had a cart and, and a wagon, so he did hauling and all. And his son David had a plot in it's the house where I now live. Um, John's great grandson, G. Ellis Miller, wrote the local history articles for the villager for 23 years. Anybody familiar with the, the articles, Drinker Beach? Uh, it was he was a descendant of uh, John Miller. The Simpson brothers were instrumental in um, Turnersville. They came to America from Ireland in 1810. Uh, they lived in Philadelphia for a while and then moved in 1817 to Soddersville to work at the, the, the turning mills there. And they worked at one of the uh, turning mills and that's where Henry Drinker met them and he convinced them to come to uh, Covington Township and set them up or established them in land that they purchased in what is now uh, Turnersville. Turnersville is a wide spot on the road. Uh, there's no actual village there anymore. Um, and they eventually uh, purchased land and set up themselves in farming. Uh, I had mentioned uh, the Holgate Mills being in, in uh, Turnersville and then moving uh, down to uh, near the Arthur Hughes Boulevard. The businesses in this area was primarily, at first, other than agriculture, it was logging. And logs were usually transported by, transported by sledding with horses and oxen. Uh, they had slides, troughs, and tram roads. They built like temporary railroads that they would be able to pull the logs over. Uh, the first wood harvested would be pine and hemlock used for construction. Most of the houses, the older houses around here are hemlock, double plank houses. Hardwood was next uh, used uh, for mine props, flooring, clothespins, furniture, handles, and kindling. And the logs were all debarked and, and they were used in the, the, the tanneries. There was a tannery in uh, Elmhurst and there was a tannery in Thornhurst, uh, Thornhurst, the one that was owned by Art uh, J. Gould. Uh, and they used a lot of the bark from the area. As I said, the closest mills uh, to Covington Township were Stoddardsville, which was 18 miles away, Slocum's Hollow, and Noblestown in Wayne County. And they were uh, the most accessible by road was the one in Stoddardsville. So in order to get a, a sack of flour, you had to go 18 miles, usually on foot. With it and, and in the wintertime on foot dragging a sled. Um, the first lumber mill was the one that was, was built along here, and that's the Espy and William Holmes mill, and as I said, it was later Hollister and Beck. Turning mills, uh, it was 1826, the, the, uh, as I said, Henry Drinker brought John Patrick and Owen Swink, uh, Simpson, William Copeland, John Holgate and Godfrey Jones here. And they, that was the one that, that moved from Turnersville eventually to, to Holgate Mills. Uh, they made brush blocks and handles and they carried the products to Philadelphia in a wagon and it took, a, it was a 10 day trip. 
Uh, there's also in some of the censuses shows that ores were one times made in one of the turning mills in this area. Um, Ted, excuse me, I don't want to cut you off entirely, um, but we are kind of running short on time. Um, yeah. I love all your photos. <laughs> if you could perhaps maybe kind of skim through some of them. That's um, what so I'm going to so do. We're not holding people up. Okay, up I'm, I'm, I just saw the time and that's what I'm going to do. The, the, the <laughs> Dale you. Mill in Daleville had a, a, a big pond behind it that they used to provide water. This is behind the Methodist Church. This is the mill being drained. Um, this was the mill when it was at its height. The drinker turnpike runs across there. Um, and this is the reason it was drained. Uh, Cedric Lamb drowned and since it wasn't being used anymore, they decided to get, get rid of the pond. This is the Methodist Parsonage. It's also the Dale House. I wanted to uh, point that out. This, this is the Methodist Church itself. And it's the only Methodist church left in town, but there was one in uh, Lehigh, there was one in Turnersville, there was one in uh, Frytown, and one near Dornstown, which didn't last very long. This is a, another picture of it. Uh, the last picture I want you to show, uh, the, I wanted to talk a little bit about schools, but this is the, the old schoolhouse in Daleville. And what's really surprising to me is this is the Drinker Turnpike. And this would have been around uh, the 1910 or so. And, and it just the size of the road amazes me because it's always talked about as a major road. And I guess for the time it was, but uh, it's awful small. And this is what a one room schoolhouse would have looked like. The one in Dornstown has been redone as an actual schoolhouse. And that's all I'm gonna show. I'm not gonna talk about the railroad and all the other stuff too. I, I told you I was a little bit wordy, but. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I loved all those pictures. It's, it's a different a different world from looking at early photos of, of Scranton to see a, a rural community. And um, that's just really scratching the surface of what I have. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I said, I did, I read at the beginning when you, you mentioned um, Shades of Death, I didn't think we could, we could top Skunk's Misery as a poorly named um, early, <laughs> early place name, but uh, Shades of Death, I think is a, is a winner. Uh, That's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will turn the program over. Um, I'm going to stop the, the screen sharing um, and I will turn the program over for questions. Um, okay. I know we have a, a few genealogists who, who've joined us. Um, so if anybody has any, any specific questions for Ted, um, please, please chime in. I, I don't have a question, Sarah, but I have a comment. Miss Stanley was my gym teacher at Tech. Oh. <laughs> do you have her book? <laughs> I didn't know she wrote one. <laughs> was she a good gym teacher? She was a really good gym teacher, and she was a really nice person. She really was. That, that's what I've heard. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I, like the, the I liked your presentation and I loved the pictures. I really enjoyed them. That added meaning to what you were talking about. I love pictures myself. I'm, I'm, I'm a picture nut. <laughs> that was really I, I nice. think we might have to have you come back and do more because mm -hmm. your pictures are incredible. And oh, thank, thank you. you. I was late and I apologize for that. But well, no, excuse, no excuse. <laughs> <laughs> On the other side, I was early. <laughs> um, I have a question. Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, yeah, um, you said um, about Wardell's house uh, being a frame house. Do you think that he built it himself? I wouldn't be surprised because he seemed to be a sort of a, a man that was up to about anything. He was. He was probably in his fifties when he came over. He was, he was, but he came over to give his, his sons a chance really is, is I, I, I got to give him a lot of credit for, for taking the, the big move at that point in his life. You know, but he, he was looking after his sons and he did pretty well for him. Thank you. Thank you again, Ted, for joining us and for sharing all of those images. Um, it's great to see so many images of the early days of a township that we don't really talk about all that often. Um, so it was it was great to to see some some early images um, and get a get a bit of a bit of background on how Covington was established. Um, please tune in again next time. Um, our next program will be on Friday, May seventh, at two o'clock. 
uh, just in time for Mother's Day. It's a special program that we're excited about. Um, we'll be joined by presidential historian Dr. Larry Cook, um, who will talk about some of the some of the less lesser known first ladies. Um, and Dr. Cook will be sharing parts, pieces of his um, presidential memorabilia collection um, to focus on the histories of um, women, including uh, Ulysses S. Grant's wife, uh, Warren Harding's wife, and others who are, aren't quite as talked about as, as often. Um, so join us again for our next series of Lackawanna Pastimes and have a lovely day.